All right, so it's 7.32 and I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Concord Light Board for September 8th, 2021. Um, so as usual, we always start with our uh, minutes update. I know Brian, you have sent around and distributed the minutes from June 8th and July 7th. Yes. Um, I'll just comment that I need to abstain from the July 7th minutes because I was not in that meeting. So. Um, but let me ask the question, do people have any additional feedback on the June 9th minute? I unfortunately did not get a chance to review them, having been traveling. Okay. Well, I'll just comment. They were pretty thorough <laughs> um, and detailed. Um, are people ready to take a vote on the minutes? We do have sort of a quorum for the, at least the June 9th minutes. Yep. Uh, yes, would you like a motion? Yes, I'd love one. All right, um, I, I move that we approve the June 9th minutes. I second. seconded. Okay, so that's a Pam second. Um, all right, I'll take a roll call. Uh, Wendy is in favor, Pam? Yep. Brian? Yes. Yep. Gordon? Yes. Uh, and Alice? I'd you. like to abstain just because I didn't get a chance okay. to read them. That's okay, mm -hmm. I appreciate that. You still um, have a quorum. Yep, you have a quorum and we'll consider them approved. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'll make another motion. Sure. Uh, I move that we approve the July, uh, I believe it was 7th. Correct. Uh, minutes, um, any seconds? Second. Okay, Gordon, thank you. All right, I'll take a roll call, Brian. Aye. Okay, Gordon. Yes. Pam? I think I was gone with you that day. I think I was absent. Um, so I'm going to abstain. I think. Okay, we're going to have an. Okay, so I'm going to have to abstain because I wasn't present. And then Alice, um, no, you're going to abstain. So we can't approve these today. So let's um, unfortunately defer the minutes for July 7th to the next meeting and um, trust that Alice will have a chance to read them by then and we'll re vote on the July 7th minutes. So thank you. And, um, and then I know we have July 14th minutes that are probably in process, right? Gordon, do you have those? Do you have those? Yeah, I, um, Alice sent me something. Uh, was that just to me, Alice? No, I sent, I did a draft okay. of the August minutes that I sent to yep. everyone, including staff who had a stake in the meeting to make sure I interpreted everything correctly. So that was August, not July. Okay. Thank you so much, Alice, for, for handling that for me. I really appreciate it. Sure. All right, so we still have July 14th and we'll revisit August uh, for next meeting. Okay, so um, sort of moving on. So from uh, in the, our next meeting is October 13th, uh, followed by November 10th and December 8th. Just wanna check, is everyone available for October 13th that you're aware of? Yep. Okay, great, All right. Yep. So good to know. Um, and then moving on to chairs update, I just have two. Wendy, updates. Wendy, before you do that, right. just yeah. um, keep in mind that we will have a special meeting in December for the budget, and we need to schedule that. Okay. Right. All right. So um, I see that December eighth must be an early meeting. So would you recommend that we do that following week, maybe the fifteenth? Yeah, most likely. Yeah. Um, we can send something out to uh, check availability, but yeah. yeah. Let's do that, and it's better to get it on the book sooner than later before everyone's calendars get busy. So thank you for that reminder, Dave. Appreciate it. Uh, Wendy, uh, just repeat again the date for November, please. Uh, November 10th. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Yep. Okay. So I'm sorry, uh, uh, David, did you just propose a, a, a date in December? No, we'll, we'll send out a poll and figure out what works best. For okay, us. I'm sorry. But consensus is that the same, like a morning 7.30 slot still works and we'll probably only need an hour. Is that a fair statement, Dave? Yeah, it generally takes about an hour. Okay, all right. So you'll send out a call and we'll try to get that on the books sooner and later. Great, thank you. All right. Okay, so moving on to chairs updates. Um, I think there's just two that I have. One was to acknowledge that I am aware that the broadband committee um, I think uh, um, appointees have been designated, but I don't know if they've been fully approved. So the select board was meeting, I think last night, maybe I'm off, 
Um, so, uh, Stephen, I don't know. Is that uh, official? Have we approved the slate of officers for that meeting, for that committee? They did a they did um, appoint a, a number of people to the committee. I don't know if it's a full slate, um, and I think they they've got about four charges going right now, and they were working on them last night. And I, I'm not sure if they finalized it. I think they came pretty close, um, and so there may be a finalized charge. And they did appoint a number of um, committee members. I just don't know how many uh, if it's a quorum. Um, so, Gordon, I, I know that you are one of the uh, appointees. Um, yeah. Do you are you aware of the other appointees? Do you want to speak to what you're aware of? Um, I'm not really sure if I can speak definitively. I, I saw an email thread, and even that is problematic in the sense that it's um, uh, you know we're really supposed to anyway. So I I. I I, I know that uh, some of the people I've seen on the thread are uh, Gail Heyer. And this is in the context of just figuring out when we'll meet and no discussion of content or any kind of deliberation of anything. It's just like, hey guys, when are you available? Uh, uh, Scott Thompson, I think, um, Gail Heyer, Mark, Ham Mark um, Hamill, me, uh, and then from the select board, um, Matt Johnson. That's all that come to mind. There may be someone else. Wendy, okay. Matt has, has his hand up if you want to. Okay. Sorry, I didn't see that. So Matt, do you want to speak to that? Sorry, I didn't see you. Yes. Uh, so Matt Johnson, uh, select board member and clerk of the select board. Uh, I just wanted to, yeah, point out that there are five members that have been appointed. Uh, I am not a member. <laughs> I, I don't know how I, I, why I'm on that email thread, but uh, I'm, I'm not a member, but the charge has been approved. Um, and yeah, Scott Hopkinson, uh, Gordon, uh, David Hessel, Mark Howell, and Gail Heyer are, have all been approved. So I believe that the uh, committee uh, has a uh, quorum that could meet. Um, so also, I just wanted to note on minutes that you can approve minutes that you for a meeting you have not attended. So it is not a problem. If you trust your uh, colleagues to write minutes and you see that they're well formed, then you can approve minutes, just, just a note. Okay. Uh, thank you, Matt, I appreciate that comment. Um, I'll just comment that particular meeting um, was a very important meeting. So I'm not, wasn't comfortable doing that, but I appreciate your comments, so. Um, all right, so, all right, so we have uh, knowledge of the, uh, the broadband committee sort of being formed and I'm sure Gordon that things will move forward in earnest soon. So, so we'll have uh, future updates on that uh, when that's applicable. So, all right, so the second, again, second topic that I wanted to review, we started a discussion last August around the format of this committee. And as many of you are aware, citizens have a strong opinion that they would prefer not to have this meeting in a webinar format. So because not all the committee members were present at the meeting last Thursday when we had last August, when we had this discussion, I wanna revisit it. So I'd like to ask each of the individual members their opinion at this point in terms of preference for a webinar versus sort of the standard format. And the standard format, again, being the format that allows citizens to be viewing who the attendees are at the meeting. So um, if you don't mind, I'll just go through <laughs> and ask people to revisit their uh, opinion on that. So. Um, I, for one, don't have strong feelings either way. I was under an impression that the webinar format was more secure. I understand there's been some improvements in that, and the risk of not having that webinar format is that if we get Zoom bombs, then we'll have to <clears throat> stop the meeting and reschedule. So um, I don't think it's been a big risk recently, so I'm in, I can go either way, and so I don't have strong opinions of webinar or the other. So. Um, um, Alice, do you have an opinion you'd like to share? Uh, no, I think my position is that I prefer the open format, allowing um, a better <coughs> conversation among the uh, participants and the board. Um, I am less concerned about Zoom bombing. I feel like we have the technology to be able to extricate someone from the meeting. Okay. Uh, Gordon? I agree with Alice. Okay, great. Uh, Brian? 
Um, I prefer this or the hybrid format um, rather than going back to the non-video format that we had prior. Um, and I'm, I'm also has a very low concern for the Zoom bombing. Okay. But I'm, I'm quite flexible. I'm, don't know, no real strong opinions. I'm vaccinated. A lot of people in town are vaccinated. Um, you know, yes, there's a Delta variant, but I think, I think it's getting under control. Okay. Um, I don't understand what he means by non-video performance. Can you, a uh, non-video? Uh, that, that would be what we did prior to having Zoom. We okay. had video. No. When we were meeting in person, their video was available. Well, no. let me comment no? this discussion we're having right now is the format of the Zoom format only. That's the only discussion okay. we're having. We'll have a separate discussion on hybrid or not. Um, but at, at this point, I'd rather keep the discussion to just the Zoom format. So, um, <clears throat> Brian, I don't know if you want to clarify your answer, if you had a, an opinion one way or another on the Zoom format. Um, I, I'm, I don't have a strong opinion either way, uh, and I don't quite understand the question then, so. So the Zoom format question is, right now we're in a webinar format, right? So the, the attendees cannot see who the other attendees are in the, given this format. If is, we is, were in a standard open format, they would be able to actually see everybody um, and know who's present in the meeting. That's the difference. Oh, that's okay. I, I would prefer they be able to see the people and I'm not worried about Zoom bombing. Okay, great. I better, thank Pam. you. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Let me just finish, Gordon. Pam? Yeah, I, uh, I favor uh, having maximum uh, participation by the public. Also, I gather that most, or if not many of our committees are doing that approach. Yep. Uh, so, okay. I, so essentially I agree with Alice. Okay. Uh, Gordon, were you about to raise your hand? Yeah. Uh, just briefly, I see that we've got um, uh, 12 attendees today, including Andy uh, Pukrik, Brad Hubbard Nelson, Catherine Vecchi, David Allen, uh, Gary Marcinick, Greg Gariello, Jerry Frankel, Joe Repoff, Carlin Reed, Mark Howell, and Matt Johnson. Um, and then a question to the panel or to David um, if we went to the standard format, right now, we're using webinar, which uh, I see just um, nine uh, faces on the screen. These are the nine participants in this event that have been promoted to panelists. If we if we get rid of basically get rid of panelists, then would that mean that everybody that's attending the meeting would have a head uh, that, that is would have a thumbnail, and that would make, for instance, my uh, head <laughs> smaller, mm -hmm. right? So that you'd lose the emphasis between uh, the, the presentation, the, the presence, so to speak, of the board members versus the um, audience. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, the, if you go to a regular standard format Zoom, um, you know, you can fit X amount on a screen. If we had a, a, a large um, attendance, you could have multiple screens and you have to, you know, okay. scroll from one to the next. So it's just something to think about, but yeah. They get smaller and you can get more. And I've had, had plenty of meetings, but we've had, you know, almost a hundred people in there and it was, you know, three, four screens worth. So, and what happens in, in that format, if you're on a different screen and you start speaking, you come to the main screen. Okay. okay. And, and the way it works, uh, even if you have a lot of tiny little thumbnails is that whoever's speaking does get promoted. So you can actually have a mode where you basically see that person. So in that case, you do have, and, and we're only, we're, we will continue to be the only ones who are allowed to speak. So we'll still have uh, the ability to project um, our expressions and so forth uh, when it is our turn, right? I mean, people can unmute and speak. You, you know, you're gonna have to implement at the beginning of the meeting, raise hand feature before you speak and then the you will you know, allow the person to speak. But um, you, you don't have a lot of control over that. I want to add that you can also in Zoom uh, set up a feature of having a panel. So you can show the board members as a separate panel along with all the other heads. So they come up first on the screen and they are prominent. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you, Alice. 
All right, so <clears throat> this, it seems to me the sentiment of the board is to allow broader access from the public. And so I would like to recommend that in our next meeting, we um, move to that sort of standard format and let's, let's give it a try. Let's see how it works. Um, you know, as the chair, I'm a little concerned about seeing people and seeing expressions, but as Gordon suggested, the people speaking are sort of visible. So we'll have a sense of that. So I'm willing to give it a try. And I think uh, if the board is in support of that, we'll, we'll take that action and move to that format for the next meeting. Um, we will remain uh, remote for the next meeting. So that's not a separate discussion. Okay, all right, great. All right, so thank you all. I appreciate that. I know this has been a long, ongoing discussion and request from the public. So I'm um, glad that we're able to move to that format. So, and Alice has raised her hand. <laughs> <laughs> so I just have a question before we go too far. Um, yeah. Gordon, I don't know what, this is basically for Gordon. As clerk, do you want to take minutes for this meeting or would you like I'm me to doing do that? that? Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that clarification, Alice, I appreciate it. Um, all right, so I think we are ready to move on to the director's update. So Dave? Yep. Um, so on September 13th, uh, we have the um, Climate Friendly Homes and Vehicles event. Um, it was gonna be in person. It's gonna be remote um, via Zoom webinar. Uh, there's 135 people registered so far and the registration remains open through September 13th. Uh, the slideshow uh, is on CMLP's homepage, uh, provides a link to the registration form. Um, a cash rebate is uh, one of the top EV purchasing influence of factors uh, cited by non-EV drivers uh, who responded to our survey uh, we conducted in July 2020. So CMLP uh, designed the Drive EV Rebate Program, which offers rebates ranging from $350 to $1,000 upon purchase or lease of a new or pre-owned EV. Uh, information about this program is now available on CMLP's website under uh, rebates for your home. Um, data compiled by Abode Energy Management <coughs> on eight heat pump programs they administer for uh, area municipal light plants show uh, tight correlation between how high the rebate cap is and the level of participation in, uh, in a community, except for Concord, which outperformed the expectations. Um, CMLP and Abode attributed this uh, to Concord's engaged uh, populace and all of the promotions that we've done, um, you know, through the process. Uh, when I get done with the um, update, I'll, I'll show you a quick slide on that. Uh, on Saturday, September 11th, CMLP staff, uh, heating and cooling coaches, EV specialists and volunteers will be uh, tabling uh, at the Concord, um, I mean, at the library book sale. Uh, and at Ag Day to promote the programs. CMLP is also partnering uh, with a library to hold a virtual Q&A session for library patrons with uh, local heat uh, pump and EV owners during the Climate Preparedness Week uh, on September 24th through the 30th. Um, on the middle school project uh, last month, uh, I had a virtual meeting with SMMA, uh, who's the architect for the um, project, Solar Design Associates. Um, it was a, a good kickoff meeting, so to speak. Um, SDA re reviewed their approach to solar on the site. Uh, design will include rooftop and canopy design. Um, we also discussed storage and um, they're also looking at uh, yeah, EV charging uh, on the site. And so, um, you know, like I said, it was the first meeting and it, and it was uh, productive, but uh, good, good start to the project. Um, we're in the process uh, of starting the uh, 2022 budget. Um, so just, uh, you know, I mentioned it earlier that we'll have a special meeting in December, but um, that process has started. And then uh, on the personnel side, um, we have a number of um, positions uh, that we're uh, trying to fill. Um, <clears throat> network engineer, we had 17 applicants. Uh, we completed first round interviews. Um, second round interviews will be completed this week. And um, we're hoping once we finish those to do the reference checks and have a recommendation up to the town manager um, early to mid next week. Um, broadband technicians, uh, we had 13 applicants. 
completed first round interviews. Um, second round interviews will, will also be completed this week. And uh, again, we'll check references and hopefully have a recommendation to the town manager early to mid next week. Um, I also participated in uh, the sustainability first round, uh, sustainability director first round interviews. Uh, second round interviews were completed, I believe, yesterday. And so, um, you know, more to come on that. We do have um, the, the line workers positions um, uh, posted and um, we're kind of working on that, but um, not getting a, a, a large interest at this point. Um, and that's my update. I'll take any questions that you might have. And I just, I also want to share that, um, that graphic that I mentioned. So this is, this is the graphic um, that kind of shows where we are right here. And so the average uh, number of rebates is the blue and the rebate cap is the, the line here. So that's what I was speaking to. Okay. Um, Dave, I see a few hands raised. Pam? Uh, yes. Um, uh, thanks, Dave. I, I have a question about the, the personnel and hiring process. Um, I, um, uh, I actually received a, a call from a, a concerned citizen, and I also am very interested in uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and uh, the town seems to be um, devoted to that idea. And in my experience, one of the most powerful ways to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion is in the hiring process. And while I understand that this hand, this probably resides in, in, in areas beyond the municipal um, life plant, um, that is the policies to promote it, I nevertheless think that every department needs to be really focused on hiring people who are um, people of color uh, and others. And I, uh, I think that there needs to be concerted work done to recruit and to uh, promote outcomes that um, help us get a more diverse and fairer workforce. So, I'm just raising that as an important issue. I'm glad, uh, Stephen, you're here because it may be that I'm completely out of line here, but I, I really believe that every committee who has considerable hiring authority, as does the light plant, needs to have an approach that maybe, maybe it exists, but for example, you know, aggressive outreach and recruitment of, of particular um, places, universities and other places that may give us a larger pool. In any event, I want it to be something that we really think about. I want to, I want to understand us as approaching it with a consciousness and a purposefulness that uh, reflects what appears to be the town's interest in diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I'd like actually, if nothing else, that there be you know, reporting on that every time we meet. And I'd also like to know if there is, there are policies that help people who are hiring in the town uh, reach out to a diverse uh, applicant pool. Thanks. Uh, Wendy, I'm happy to comment now, or if other people have comments about it, I can hold off. Uh, no, actually, if you could comment now, that would be good. I was going to look to you or Dave. Thanks. So um, I guess the question is, and this is somewhat rhetorical, is if we do a lot of recruiting, um, say, of people of color for racial diversity, um, what are they going to find when they get here? Are we sure that we're an organization that is ready to be inclusive and, uh, and, provi and provide a sense of belonging to people of, of diverse backgrounds? Uh, and so the journey we're on, Pam, is... Uh, we are working with an advisor and it's it's all SMT. And we're, so we're not doing it department by department. It's SMT members um, working together to um, really learn more about um, what diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging means, uh, the ways that we as managers can sometimes um, unintentionally um, make people feel um, like they're not included um, and, and that they don't belong. Um, and so... That's really the focus, and and we, you know, that's the that the choice 
to really focus on making sure that we're ready to be more diverse, more equitable, more inclusive, and that uh, people will feel like they belong here is the goal. Um, the goal really is to be the employer of choice uh, amongst municipalities. So everyone really, no matter who they are um, or what background they have, they really want to come work for the town of Concord. Uh, and so that is a much bigger picture than just hiring and recruitment. And this is something that we've talked with our advisor about quite a bit. And so we are, and, and the other thing that, that I think people need to remember is DEI, DEIB is a journey. Um, and even though as a group, we, SMT, myself, others in town, are on this journey together, we are still at different places individually. And that's, it's not just a recruitment strategy. It is a cultural change and organizational change and personal growth for everybody involved. And so I, it really is much more of a process um, than I think just a uh, um, hiring strategy. Now, I will tell you, um, Pam, that to your point, a recruiting and hiring strategy that generates a more diverse pool of applicants than we currently have uh, is definitely one of the steps in this journey, a big one, but it's really who are we as an organization and, and how would we make, how do how would we make somebody feel do they, if they, if they don't, if they are, if they are diverse, if they're, if they're not, um, you know, if they if they aren't, um, if they don't see a lot of people like them, of whatever that identification is around them, are they going to feel like they belong? And so that's really where we're focused. Um, can I respond to that? I, yeah. I, um, I mean, this is a very complicated area and I, I'm, I'm grateful for your having help from consultants. What you're saying sounds to me, uh, and I, it's very tricky even using the right vocabulary, but it sounds patronizing. Um, I think that if we broaden the pool, uh, people can make decisions on their own as to whether they find our community welcoming. I mean, I think it's important to continue to really examine Concord, which has you know, many, many issues related to fairness and, and equity and diversity. I think that's hugely valuable. You know, life happens when you're making plans, as John Lennon said, and I think that waiting to just you know see if people are going to be comfortable with us is i don't know it doesn't sound it doesn't resonate well with me and i would imagine that it might not resonate well with some other people i think the real issue is get the opportunities out there and in parallel work on the issues you're describing but don't wait and have a sequential thing going on and i also think i go back to my original point and i hesitate to use these words because i i know it's really tricky but it does sound like we're going to decide when somebody feels comfortable in our community. And that is really strange. That's um, not what I so, said, Pam. And, and I, I'm honestly, I'm pretty offended that you said it was patronizing because what I just laid out to you was um, we want to make sure we're comfortable that we are um, inclusive and create a sense of belonging. So when we, when we do recruit uh, people of diverse backgrounds to come here that they that we're ready for them that we're ready for them to feel to make the, to make them feel comfortable and that we're comfortable ourselves with being around people who um, are, are of different backgrounds uh, different races than we are and so um, I, I don't I, I I'm sorry if I didn't communicate that clearly enough but it is a process and we do want to make sure both our 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 workforce but also the community I mean the community does have diversity I think people tend to focus on racial diversity as, as the kind of most obvious thing that you see. And there's, you know, reasons for that because it, you can see racial diversity more easily than you can see other types of diversity, but Concord does have a lot of diversity. And so I think we, we also want to think about what does diversity mean? And, and these are conversations that, I mean, in many ways really haven't happened all that often and in, in any great depth. And so that's really, that's what the journey is, is, is having, thinking about it, having conversations about it. And then, and like I said, getting ourselves to a place where um, we are um, welcoming and inclusive. And, and that's the big, it's, that's the biggest thing is, is you can't fake that. And we okay, want to make I sure just, that. I, that's, 
Yeah, yeah, I understand. And I want to apologize if I offended you, Stephen. Mm. I didn't mean to, and I was I prefaced it by saying that these are very difficult things to talk about. And I was very concerned about my own semantics. So I obviously failed in that respect because I did not want to offend you. Um, I will repeat, however, that I think that there is something peculiar about the way this is being uh, described, at least to me. And I, I also think that, you know, again, back to John Lennon, you can, life happens when you're making other plans and, you know, we can study this to death and uh, it will be really valuable to do that. But I encourage us to in simultaneously find, think of things that are being done in a lot of places to make sure that we are um, being um, using any opportunity we have. And the hiring process is a big one to do things that will help us um, you know, grow as a community. And I think you can have, it's almost a chicken and the egg thing. If you keep studying it, you're never gonna, I mean, it's just an interesting situation. So I just wanna conclude by saying, A, I'm sorry I used the wrong words. It's a very, very tricky thing to talk about. Um, and I really applaud what you're doing, um, but I encourage us to um, think about how we're talking about this stuff. It, it sounds a little bit, um, well, I've said what I need to say, and I'm, I'm very grateful for what you're doing, actually, but I, so, I wish we, it's a very tricky issue. So Pam and Stephen, thank you for the conversation. I think it's very good that we, the leadership team is educating themselves on sort of being sensitive to diversity and the needs and cultural and everything. That's the first step because you need to know what you're, what you're, what you're dealing with from a society, et cetera. So I think that is a good first step. I think to the degree there's recruitment that's difficult, you know, whether it's the line manager, sometimes outreaching to those diverse groups is actually a very beneficial way to do recruitment. So to Pam's point, there are some probably some opportunities out there that you haven't leveraged. But um, at this point, I don't want to belabor this discussion. Um, and we can have future updates on the diversity um, for future updates. So um, to Brian um, and Alice, I know your hands are raised. I'm just going to remind everybody that we're starting to get behind schedule. So if I can ask you to comment, and um, I'm assuming you're commenting on Dave's original status update. So Brian, do you want to raise your question, whatever it was? <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so Dave, uh, it's great that we now have um, a rebate program for the purchase of EVs. Um, I, I took a look at the web page. It's great that it's income qualified um, and that it, you know, it, it's, thank you. It's a, it's a great addition and it really does go to adoption. Um, the other comment I had was, you said you got, um, uh, you had talked to S, um, Solar Design Associates about the middle school, um, and you talked about storage. What are your, what are your goals for that property and storage? Because um, it's going to be a large array, and we have a solar saturation issue. So um, what are your thoughts about scaling that system, uh, do you want it uh, capable to absorb all of its production um, during those solar saturation hours? Um, uh, you know, what's the scale of the storage that you're looking at uh, for that facility? So we're early on, Brian. Uh, okay. You know, in terms of size, we haven't um, got into all of that. We did briefly talk about it. We looked at something that um, SDA did at uh, the Groton School, very interesting. Um, but the, the thing I would say is um, this site is on the other side of the um, system. So we have two transformers. One is right at the you know, breaking point, if you will. This is on the other transformer. So we have a little room to play. I see. Good. Good. Thank you. And Dave, I know in the future we'll be talking about battery storage as part of our strategy. So there'll be future updates on our longer term strategy there as well. So but thanks for that update. Um, Alice. Thank you. Um, mine is also about the middle school project. Maybe I misheard Dave's uh, introduction to it. I believe you said that you met with SMMA and I was wondering if maybe it was the solar design. I, who did you meet with to talk about solar at the middle school? And where are we in the project? I just got a little... So we, we met with um, the architect from the school. There were some school members on and uh, solar design associates. 
So it was kind of a, a kickoff meeting to kind of talk about the project and, you know, highlight any issues um, that could arise and, you know, making the, <clears throat> the site solar and storage ready, regardless of, of when the stuff gets installed. But the intention is to install it, but to make sure that when the site work's done, conduits aren't forgotten, things of that nature. So it was a good meeting. So the Solar Design Associates are the separate um, consulting firm that I think Stephen had early on committed that we would bring on board to help us with the design. Is that right? Correct. Okay. And they are working with SMMA and uh, um, on the total design of the project, making sure that there's a solar component. Okay. I would love to hear a periodic updates on the middle school project as we go along. It'd be great. Yeah. And, that, and that's the intent as we go and, and have more information to provide to definitely bring them here. Okay. Great. It is going to be an impact as the, the solar array is going to be owned by the light plant. So yeah. uh, you guys will be informed. Okay. Yeah. Uh, great. Uh, quick, Thank you. Quick clarification. So are, is SMM, SMMA talking to you and Solar Design Associates talking to you, or are they talking directly to each other? Uh, it's both. Okay. So all, all, three are in, all three are in direct communication. Okay. Right. Thank you. Um, Gordon? Quickly, yeah. You're what is SMMA? It's the architectural firm for this middle school. Um, and they have worked with the Solar Design Associates on other projects. So the idea was to have them be concurrent, but not together. It's a separate project for the middle school project. And I would just add that on September 20th, the select board will, I think at 630, the select board will be having a focused meeting to talk about financing for the middle school. Thank you for that input. Appreciate that. Great. All right. So um, I am not seeing any hands raised. So I would like to move along in the agenda. Um, so Dave, the next agenda item is the customer survey results. Um, yep. we so I just brought Catherine in. No, she's, okay. She's going to go through that from Greater Blue. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Catherine from Great Blue. I'm just going to pull up the presentation real quick. Uh, let's see. See my screen okay? Yes. All right, let's get started. So um, today I'm going to present with you the results of the 2021 customer survey that we did for you all a couple months ago, um, primarily having to do with uh, smart meter installation in Concord. Um, so just to kind of go through a couple of these initial slides really quickly, this is just about Great Blue. Um, basically, we do a lot of work with um, you know wide variety of different industries, but utilities are our primary uh, utility research is our primary focus. And we do a lot of research with public power utilities across the country and specifically with a lot of the other meme organizations as well. So about this project, um, so we um, were commissioned by CMLP to um, learn a little bit more about customer awareness of and interest in smart meters in town. Um, so the primary goals were obviously to determine what the current awareness levels were, uh, perceived importance of different benefits of smart meters, willingness to pay a little bit extra per electric bill in order to support um, accelerating needs to CMLP's non-carbon emitting power supply and um, the perception of how well CMLP fits a certain uh, list of certain brand attributes. So to accomplish these research goals, we use both the telephone and digital survey methodology, and we surveyed both residential and commercial customers in town. Um, so overall, we hope that the outcome helps to uh, kind of get a better understanding of where awareness levels are at, interest levels of smart meters in town, and determine uh, how to kind of move forward with different marketing and communications efforts about the topic. So our areas of investigation. Um, so, um, you know, we talked about awareness of smart meters. We asked about interest in having a smart meter installed in your home or business, uh, the perceived importance of several benefits of smart meters. We asked about customers' willingness to pay an additional amount per electric bill to support CMLP's commitment to a 100% non-carbon emitting power supply by 2030. Uh, and then lastly, we capped it off with um, asking for the perception of how well CMLP fits certain brand attributes. And then obviously a demographic and firmographic profile of the respondents as well. So look into the research methodology. Um, so for our residential snapshot, uh, we only ended up using a digital survey methodology for this group. 
Um, reason being was we set up to see how many digital surveys we could capture. Um, our goal was to ultimately hit a total of 400. We ended up with 1,011. So we ended up not having to go to the phone uh, methodology sign on this one. As, um, this is a really good response rate, um, especially just you know given the number of customers in town, we were really surprised to see this, um, you know, this many folks who were eager to complete the survey, which is really good news. Um, the survey was on the shorter side. We had a 29 question survey. Um, with those 1,011 completed surveys, the margin of error uh, for the study is 2.6%. Uh, so what this essentially means is that if you were going to go ahead and conduct this study 100 times, uh, 95 out of 100 times, the results would come in somewhere within plus or minus 2.6 percentage points of the results that I'm going to show you all today. And then lastly, we have our research dates. We started fielding this online on June 28th and then wrapped up on July 16th. So we left it open for about three weeks to allow as many respondents as possible to complete the survey. Uh, just a little bit of the demographic profile of respondents. Um, as far as age, we did see the demographic leaning a little bit towards the older side, but um, still you know, a pretty good representation from kind of that 35 to um, 64 age group as well. Um, as far as income goes, um, you know, we always see a lot of people saying prefer not to see on this question. Obviously, it's sensitive information. Um, we do see 30.6% are in that $200,000 or more. Um, so leaning a little bit more towards high income for this one. Um, and then as far as gender goes, um, you know, obviously, we're seeing primarily, um, we saw 49.1% male, 39.1% um, woman or female, and, um, you know, a mix of, of some others as well. And for our commercial uh, methodology snapshot, um, we, we did use both a digital and phone survey methodology on this one. Um, you know, originally our goal was to get 50 completes. We ended up falling short by about four, but um, in the grand scheme of things, four completes is not gonna really sway the results too, too much. Um, so we ended up with 46 completes for this one. Um, that's pretty comparable to most of the other commercial, uh, you know, utility customer research that we do. Usually we are able to get around 50 completes for, for, the, uh, for the utility. Um, this one yields a margin of error of 13.9%. And then we similarly, we started fielding this one on June 28th, and we ended up taking this to July 27th to try and get as many completes as we could. So our, uh, you know, a little bit of firmographic information about our commercial customers here. Um, primarily, these folks are coming from either like an office space or a retail space um, type of business. Um, and then as far as number of employees, we're seeing a lot more on kind of the smaller business side. We're seeing a lot that are in the less than five or five to 10 um, or just, you know, more than 10, um, you know, number of employees. So our key study findings, and I'll go through these pages kind of quickly because we're going to touch on these once we get to all the charts and graphs and fun stuff. But um, these were just kind of a couple takeaways that uh, we saw from the data. Um, one was to communicate the smart meter cost information to customers. Um, when folks were asked if they had any questions or concerns regarding smart meters, um, we saw a lot of folks um, having questions about the cost of smart meters, both, um, you know, the cost to upgrade and install smart meters, as well as um, any cost savings that they might experience after, after they install a smart meter. Um, so the recommendation here is to, um, in any communication materials, really emphasize what the specific, um, you know, costs of this structure might be, because this will help answer a lot of questions. And, um, you know, if folks are a little bit more aware of what kind of cost savings they could see, it'll probably build support for smart meters as well. And then next we had communicate outage restoration efficiency and smart meter communication. Um, I'll get to this in a couple slides, but when asked about um, you know, how important some of the benefits of smart meters were to them. Uh, people really prioritize the fact that the meter can alert CMLP right away when their power goes out so that they can um, get to that restoration process right away and restore power as quickly as possible. Um, that was really a, a priority for a lot of customers. So the recommendation here is to really promote that as well um, when communicating about smart meters. And then lastly, we have build overall awareness of smart meters. Um, we saw that nearly two fifths and um, about one third of commercial respondents were aware of smart meters. So obviously, you know, that's some of the population, but there's a lot of room to kind of grow um, and build awareness and knowledge of smart meter technology. Um, so the overall recommendation here is just to increase the frequency of communication and education about this topic to customers. So to get right into the data, um, like I just mentioned, um, we asked customers, you know, the first question in the survey was how aware you are of smart meters. This is asked before they see any kind of a um, description of what smart meters are. This is just kind of the general term. And we see that 38.9% of residential customers, so nearly two fifths, um, and then nearly one third of commercial customers, 31.1%, um, said in total that they were aware of smart meters. 
And then when asked in a follow-up open-ended question, specifically what they know about smart meters, um, we do see that the majority of customers, um, both on the residential and commercial side, said nothing or not much. Um, so they weren't, you know, even if they were, um, you know, claimed to be aware of the topic, they couldn't really name anything specific that they know about smart meters. Uh, but we did see some individuals uh, mentioning the wireless and remote reading and monitoring capabilities of, capabilities of smart meters, as well as the ability to track, um, collect, and provide real-time usage information. Um, so now um, in the survey, customers um, were read or saw um, a description of what uh, these meters would look like in CMLP. And then they were asked if they would be interested in having one of these smart meters installed at their home or business. Um, so what you see is that a little over two thirds of uh, residential customers, 67.8%, um, as, well, as well as nearly one half of commercial respondents, 46.7%, were either very or somewhat interested in these um, smart meters being installed at their home or at their business. So um, a little bit more awareness, or um, sorry, a little bit more interest among residential customers than commercial customers. Um, we are seeing you know, a slight majority of of residential customers being interested, but um, you know, on the flip side, we're also seeing a lot of people in this kind of don't know unsure column. Um, so just really signifying a need to have a little bit more information um, and knowledge about, about smart meters before they determine how interested they are or not. So now looking into some of the benefits of smart meters and how um, important customers find those benefits to be. Um, this first page, these are benefits that are a little bit more pertaining to the specific customer experience, um, you know, customer service kind of benefits. Um, and we see, like I mentioned earlier, um, you know, the vast majority of both residential and commercial respondents said that it's important that the meter will alert CMLP if their power goes out so that they can get to work right away restoring their power. So that is, um, you know, one of the highest priorities that um, you know, customers have regarding these smart meters. Um, we also did see quite a few, um, you know, prioritizing the fact that there's access to an online dashboard to show their energy usage and help them, um, you know, use the tool to save energy and money, um, just having a little bit more awareness of what their actual energy consumption levels are. Um, so that's also a priority as well. But um, overall, you know, one of the top priorities is just that, um, you know, increased speed, you know, increased perceived speed of outage restoration that, that's coupled with the smart meters. And then this page are a couple more benefits that we um, asked customers about in the survey um, regarding smart meters that are a little bit more pertaining to um, CMLP as a whole. Um, we see over four fifths of residential customers and over three quarters of commercial customers prioritize the fact that um, the new metering system would have help CMLP manage the system more efficiently, um, thus resulting in uh, lower costs and improved reliability. Um, so that was also a priority for folks. Um, some residential customers also prioritize the fact that um, this will help CMLP to plan for, um, you know, the increased demand on the electric system due to things like electric vehicles and hybrid uh, vehicles as well. Um, so then, you know, after folks, um, you know, read these benefits, we asked them, um, based on those benefits of smart meters, um, would they like the meter at their home or business to be upgraded? Um, we do see, you know, about three fifths of residential customers, 60.4%, and then nearly one half of commercial customers, 48.9%, um, would like their the meter at their home to be upgraded. Once again, we are seeing that um, about a third of both customer bases um, said don't know or unsure. So again, points us um, in the direction that there's just a little bit more education that's needed on the topic. So uh, folks know a little bit more and can determine if they'd like their meter to be upgraded or not. And then when asked if they have any questions or concerns regarding the smart meters, um, you know, obviously we saw a lot of people said none, none at this time. Um, that happens all the time when we ask these open-ended open kinds of questions, but um, we did see a lot of costs, um, a lot of, uh, you know, concerns and questions uh, coming up in this open-ended um, response regarding costs. So things like the cost to upgrade and install um, a new smart meter, uh, what their rates would look like, any changes to their rates um, and their bill, um, and then any you know ultimate cost savings that they might see as well. So really primary concerns and questions are having to do with cost. Um, and then you know a lot of residential customers also mentioned just a general need for more information about things like the benefits and downsides of smart meters, um, cost rate ratio, things like that. Um, so, you know, a lot of areas where they just need a little bit more education, but specifically uh, bringing up cost a lot more than other responses. Uh, this question was asked only to commercial customers and we asked if they think their organization would be able to shift their um, shift their load to use electricity at more off peak hours of the day. Um, 
to, you know, in order to kind of maximize the, the smart meters. And we see only 13.3% of customers, of commercial customers said that they'd be able to do so, um, while about two thirds, 66.7% said that they're not able to do so, and 20%, one fifth, were um, unsure if they could make that shift. Um, next, we um, discuss CMLP's goals to achieve an 100% non carbon emitting power supply by 2030 um, from about the 50% um, you know, standard that they're at currently. And we asked if customers would be um, interested in, in um, CMLP accelerating that goal, reaching that 100% goal sooner than 2030. And um, you know, obviously with the caveat that that would likely cost a little bit more money on their electric bill. Um, so if that option was available, um, we asked if they would be willing to pay more money. Um, a quarter of residential customers and, and over a third of commercial customers said that they would not be willing to pay more money. Um, but we did see, um, you know, about a fifth of residential customers willing to pay either up to 10% more or up to 5% more. Um, and then some commercial customers as well um, were willing to pay a little bit more on their electric bill. Um, and again, we see a lot of folks um, that don't know unshared with this question as well. Uh, lastly, looking at some brand attributes of CMLP, um, this is kind of a, a you know, grid list that um, folks had to rate um, you know, how well each of these characteristics describes CMLP. Um, so we saw that over four fifths um, of both residential and commercial, commercial customers felt that um, reliable is a attribute that fits CMLP very well. Um, we also saw a lot of residential customers saying words like trustworthy, responsive, and provides value um, associate well with the CMLP brand. Um, and then we saw more commercial customers um, saying that um, the phrases cares about customers and forward thinking um, are good brand attributes that um, you know, are really relevant to the CMLP brand. And then lastly, just some considerations. We kind of touched on these a little bit briefly, but to go into a little bit more depth here, um, our first one was to communicate cost information of smart meters to customers. Um, when asked if they had any questions or concerns regarding the smart meters, um, nearly one fifth of residential and commercial customers reporting having concerns about the cost of smart meters specifically to upgrade and install their meters as well as any cost savings that they might see. Um, so the recommendation here is that in any communications of materials about the smart meters, that CMLP includes some um, specific information about the cost of installing smart meters, both um, to CMLP and to the customer, as well as how much money they could expect to see um, in savings um, on their electric bill after installing a smart meter. Um, any kind of rough projections that customers can see will probably um, you know, help them kind of visualize the benefits of smart meters a little bit more and help to you know, ultimately build um, interest in awareness and interest in the smart meters. And then lastly, we have educate customers of increased outage response efficiency smart meters result in. Um, like I mentioned before, when asked about some of the different benefits of smart meters and how important they were to customers, um, more customers prioritized um, the fact that this would help um, you know, notify CMLP as soon as their power goes out so that CMLP can get to uh, work right away restoring their power. Um, that was you know, a high priority among customers. So it's recommended that in communication materials um, about the smart meters that CMLP really prioritize this um, as one of the benefits of the smart meters to help also build um, interest in the program. And that is everything I have today. This is just um, some of our contact information. Um, if you have any other questions after the presentation about the results where um, you know, all these individuals have touched the project in some way and can help you out. Um, and my contact information specifically is down in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, and at this point, we can open up to any questions that you have for me now. Uh, just, uh, just comment. That was a great presentation. You covered an enormous amount of information very quickly. So thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm impressed by the customer response on the residential side. So that's great. I think we should all feel good about the results. Um, I'll also just note that some of the survey was done during our outage. Um, so I hope it didn't really skew anything, but I, I don't think it did, but we'll never know for sure. But. I the good news on that front, because I, I was aware of that when we were fielding it. And the good news is that this wasn't really a customer satisfaction survey. So we weren't asking people to rate how satisfied they are with CMLP, how satisfied they are with outage response time, things like that. Um, so I think the good news is that the nature of the survey wasn't a satisfaction-based survey. So hopefully the results weren't skewed by it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was some unreliability in brand, but regardless, I think it was a great survey. So um, Gordon, I thought I saw you raise your hand. Yep, 
You there? <laughs> yes, thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll lower that. Yeah, um, thank you very much for that. Are we gonna get a copy of this, David? Yeah, I'm, we're gonna, it's gonna be on the website. Um, so yeah, you, you will have, we'll send you a copy, but it will be on the website. Um, I, I just ask um, everybody on the board that just uh, saw this presentation, this presentation was excellent. Thank you to, um, please take a look at this and study it. We're tasked with the role of, of trying to balance um, inputs that we receive from management of the town, uh, staff, participants in these meetings who are often very vocal and have very strong views, but that actually can only really, in a sense, represent themselves. Of course, we represent ourselves too with our own life experiences. It goes back to diversity we were talking about a second ago. But a survey like that, like this, is an opportunity or a tool that we can use to try and think more uh, globally about how some of these things might be perceived by everybody in town. So um, this is a really great opportunity. Thank you for this. And now I just have a question for the board. Um, we just went through, uh, well, 20 pages of slides. I'm not gonna try to capture uh, the words that were spoken. I will just um, uh, refer to this or post it, include it with the minutes, and then I'll just try to uh, focus on whatever afterward conversation was taken, right? Yeah, well, we'll and yeah, you just basically summarize saying presentation was given, we'll attach the presentation, and um, that, that's all you need to do. Right. Very helpful. Uh, Brian? Um, so question about, so it sounds in, to generalize that um, people are very curious about AMI. Um, they desire to learn more. They desire to have more information and data um, and that we need to do more outreach to them to educate them on the cost benefit analysis as well as um, the tools that will they'll be provided um, in understanding their own energy consumption. Mm -hmm. um, there was a um, there was you know a very good response from residents, but from the commercial sector there was a, a not as great a response. Uh, is there a way? Do you think that we could in the next time of doing a survey? better reach our commercial customers? Um, I know you did some phone and digital, um, but did they give you any response as to why they answered um, and so forth? Um, so are you referring to just the general number of completes or just the actual? Yes, response? general number of completes. Yeah, so I mean, you know, usually with a, you know, a customer base and a utility of your size, um, we usually propose about 50 completed commercial surveys just based on the ratio of how many completes you get to how many customers you have. Um, I think what we find really well, it um, works really well is if um, before the survey effort actually begins, if there's communication to um, those commercial customers ahead of time, hey, you might be seeing a call from um, Great Blue Research, it'll be coming from this caller ID number. Um, that way, if they get the call, they're not just, you know, blowing it off or something like, hey, this is just another spam call. They're actually answering the phone because they're anticipating the call. Um, or, you know, they're anticipating an email from us coming from a specific address, um, they know to look for it. And then just to emphasize, um, you know, this, these results are really important because we want to get your feedback on, you know, whatever the you know, particular survey is, um, this will help drive, you know, results at the utility, things like that. Um, you know, we usually will send out kind of a one page memo like press release um, that's pretty standard and we'll just kind of replace some language depending on the company um, that can be sent out maybe like a week ahead of fielding um, to you know customers just so that they're aware of the survey um, that's something we find tends to work well especially when it's coming from the utility itself because they already have a relationship with you versus you know, just getting a call from Great Blue Research, they have no idea who we are. But if they're already seen our name pop up before in communication from their utility, they'll probably actually pick up the phone, um, which helps us a ton because it's it's tough reaching commercial customers with the pandemic. You know, a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of businesses have um, gone out of business. Um, so that's a, just a general struggle we've had the past 18 months or so. Um, but I think, you know, in general, for both, for both customer bases, it's helpful to have communication ahead of time. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, it's a good lesson learned, I think, in general, that transcends not just the lifespan, but right. Good idea. So great. Um, Pam, I see your hand raised. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, that was a great presentation and very clear, and I really appreciate it. Uh, mm -hmm. One slide was about willingness to pay more for a cleaner 
for cleaner electricity, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and I'm just curious about that. And I guess my reaction is somewhat some disappointment that that was the what you found. Um, and and it seems to me that it indicates more education mm -hmm. is needed because, as we know, um, to be very um, overgeneralizing, it's affluent communities like ours that are the main one of the most important contributors to these problems by our consumption um, and the externalities we impose on the rest of the world. And I think that um, it's just telling to me that we had this sort of response and I'm very sympathetic with it because I think a lot of this has to do with, with I hope, education. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just wanted you to comment on what you found and whether there's uh, how, I'm not a statistician, I don't know how significant that that piece of data was, but it's it was striking to me. And I wonder as well, am I connecting it appropriately with uh, education or am I overthinking this or just, what do you think? I think I think education's a really, um, that's definitely part of it. Um, you know, we, we ask questions of this nature with a lot of the utility surveys that we do. Um, sometimes we'll ask more general questions about, um, you know, do you how important do you think renewable energy initiatives are and obviously a ton of people say that it's important over four fifths usually and then you bring costs into it and then you bring in hey but you know to achieve these renewable energy goals you need to pay x percent more on your bill now how important is it to you and then anytime you bring kind of a cost factor into it no matter how affluent the community is people are a little bit more hesitant especially when you use things like percentages when you're thinking okay what is five percent of my electric bill what is ten percent of my electric bill things like that so um you know we did see you know some about 40 percent of residential customers would pay somewhere around five or ten percent um which is which is good um we also saw a lot of people said don't know unsure so it's not like you know obviously that kind of no, those no columns were the higher columns but it was still around 25 or 30 percent um so it's not as if 75 percent of customers said, no, absolutely not. I will not pay any money. There were a lot that fell into that unsure category. So I think there is probably some uncertainty about what this would look like. You know, how much money am I going to have to pay? Is it going to be every electric bill or is this like a one-time thing? You know, what does this kind of system look like? So, um, and, and also I think what we see a lot of times is people don't know you know, my, if I'm paying extra money on my electric bill, is that directly going into these projects or, mm -hmm. you know, the utility yeah. using it for something else? Like what is actually being used for? So that's another thing that we found that a lot of customers are less willing to pay more money if they don't know for sure it's going to the projects they want it to go to. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there's like a lot of factors for it, but I, I don't see it as a complete negative because that no column wasn't like the majority of customers saying, no, I won't pay any more money. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's really helpful. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. And, you know, Pam, you raised a good question about sort of education. And I think, you know, we are paying a little more for some of our energy costs too. That's the rec surcharge that we have. So we as a board have to be mindful of that too. And that's another place where we need to educate. So, um, so more to follow. And we'll talk more about this as we go forward too. I'm going to actually go to Laura, who's got her hand raised or has had it raised for a while. Laura. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. May I share my screen? Sure. Okay. So can you see uh, this chart? Yes. So it was actually a total of 57%, not 40, that said that they would be willing to pay more. It was 20% that said 10% and 20% that said 5%, but there was another 17% it said I'd be willing to pay 15% more. So if you add all that up, that's 57%. And only 25% said absolutely not. And the other 18% was unsure. So I just wanted to highlight that it was actually a little bit bigger of a mm -hmm. slice. And this is to increase what is already 50% renewable to 100% before 2030. So we're all expecting CMLP's power supply to get to non-carbon emitting 100% by 2030. This was prompted, if you may recall, by a couple of citizens that came to the board and specifically requested a rate that would enable them to achieve that 100% quicker than the 2030 timeline. And they said they'd be willing to pay more. Do, do you recall, the board yep. members recall that? Yeah. So yep. that's 
we, we used this customer survey, which was primarily about um, advanced metering to get some feedback on this particular issue. Um, and so that that's, I just wanted to, to clarify that. Thank you. That, that's wonderful to see. Thanks, and it's, this, that detail is all in those results that we're gonna get. And I'll just remind everybody that we're gonna have, a, we have an agenda item later on in the meeting to talk about um, that question about the um, non-carbon emitting power supplies also. So, um, and I'm gonna remind everyone again that we are behind schedule. So Gordon, if I can call on just, you and let's be quick. Okay, just, just briefly, uh, that question and the uh, pie chart is posed in terms of uh, how much percentage increase, but you know, you could also put it in terms of how many dollars. And it's actually the percentage, I think, the way that I understand it is it's against the energy portion of the bill, right? So that's not necessarily your whole bill would go up by this amount. So anyway, the phrasing of the question can make a difference. Yep, okay, good point. All right, so this has actually been a really great presentation and a good discussion. I wish we had more time to talk about it, but we won't. But I'll just remind people, this was a very uh, deliberate survey that was conducted as part of our larger strategy. So um, great milestone that we've achieved. And I, I think just to reiterate sort of Gordon's point, everyone should look at those results in a lot more detail offline. And we'll, I'm sure, this is gonna play in also to our upcoming stakeholders meeting, which we will also talk about in a separate agenda item. So, so thank you all, appreciate that. Um, I think the next agenda item that we need to move toward is the broadband update, Dave, and I'm not sure who's providing that. Oh, here we go, here's Greg. And you all had some materials that were set in advance. I trust everyone's had a chance to read those as well. So, all right, Greg, I guess it's all yours. Um. Apologize for the delay. That was uh, not uh, that was for those two last two pieces. Um, so the uh, update uh, as of uh, September second, uh, we've had fifteen hundred and seven active accounts, thirteen hundred eighty three uh, residential, and one hundred eighteen business. Um, we've I just filed the um, so something that you're probably not aware of. We have an annual or biannual report that's due to the FCC every every year. It's called the 477 report, and it is due on uh, March 1st and uh, September 1st. Has been extended twice due to the pandemic. And just to report that uh, we have filed um, the FCC report prior to the 1st of September. Um, the backlog um, is developed. Uh, uh, I mean, it's interesting how it's developed. When we uh, reported that we uh, received 176 responses from our mailing of the 419 uh, customer backlog, um, 151 positive. Uh, we have been focusing on that group of people. Our original goal was to, thinking we were gonna have the whole 400. And um, as we've multiple times tried to contact people on the list, we're pretty sure now that we're, the number is approximately about 100 and, probably about 150 is exactly what our backlog is. Um, so we're approaching that with those people who are coming back positive and we're, um, and then also continuing to pursue the new move-ins, EDUs and uh, any uh, first medical, uh, first response uh, as a priority. Our installations have, go ahead. Can I just interrupt for just a second? I just wanna be clear about the backlog because your materials, we originally thought there were 419 customers in the backlog. Are you saying definitively that there's 150 in the backlog? I, I yeah, I, again, we've, we've made multiple attempts to contact those, the, the backlog and um, our, from our first, you know, the first real um, survey, we only got back 176 responses. And again, 151 people still want Concord broadband. Um, and we've gone, we are simultaneously going down the, we're prioritizing now the 151 and we are continuing to try to contact the people in the backlog. Um, we've sent out a couple more emails. We're not, we're just not seeing the responses. So we, we are in belief that many people could go to Comcast or whatever because of the, we weren't doing installations. Um, so that's just what we, that's what we have to conclude at this point. Uh, we, we did not, I've not seen one more response to the, the original survey or any of the secondary uh, um, contacts that we've tried to make to the 
overall backlog that we thought we had of 400 million. Okay, because that's a, just a dramatically different number. So it's oh, really it, it absolutely is. Validated. And, okay. Yes, it, yep, it is. And and um, we're surprised. Uh, um, I really thought we'd I'd start seeing um, trickling in responses. We have seen literally zero. Um, so right. sorry, right. to we'll keep going. <laughs> okay, no problem. Uh, installations are nearly reached pre-pandemic uh, levels. We're averaging about 20 to 30 installs monthly. Uh, as Dave gave the personnel report, we're hoping to have a fourth technician on. And our goal is to reach 45 installations per month, which should be an increase of about 33% annually. Um, again, I won't, I'm, I can skip the personnel. Dave gave you that update. Uh, I just ask one question. When do you stop doing installations? November, December, or when the weather really turns? When do we stop? Yeah, we, I mean, we, usually in the winter, there's some, yes. fall, right? You're it, not doing installations once that? It is a temperature thing. And so we just we okay. continue to do them until we, we see the trend is consistent that the fiber okay. is not malleable, you know, not able to uh, be spliced easily in, 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 in the winter months. Um, Current broadband projects, uh, we're working very closely. We're now having a uh, monthly uh, meeting with, I sorry, twice a month with the um, customer service team. And we're in the process right now of, as I stated, you know, one meeting that upgrading the, um, updating the terms and conditions. Uh, we're also, uh, one of the projects we're working on that is really, uh, we're excited about is we're now doing service orders, automated service orders prior to or say currently, the we weren't capturing the data of uh, going into a home. And so for example, what walkthrough is our first step when the customer wants a um, wants broadband service. And they weren't creating the service orders until that walkthrough was completed. And which then if the if the customer for whatever reason they needed time or whatever the reason we didn't um, bring that customer on board, we had no data uh, about that visit. So what we've uh, decided is we're doing service orders immediately, uh, creating a service order immediately. And so we, we do a walkthrough and we go to a, a customer home and they do need conduit, whatever the case may be. And they choose not to go forward because of cost. And that would be conduit from the, the street to their home. We are capturing that data. So we will have that data on that address. Um, we're also automating service orders so they can be received in the field updated from the field, and we're really moving away from paper. Um, all the documents are now being uploaded into a document vault, which is um, connected to this customer service um, uh, application. And now the customer service team will see those updates much sooner than they um, ever have. Uh, so it's we think it's gonna really create efficiency. The technicians will be able to do 90% of their work <clears throat> from the field will not have to return to the office for any kind of updating of any systems or any of that. And um, it, we believe it'll completely increase the uh, efficiency of installations in general. Um, GIS um, mapping, we are almost complete with our <clears throat> migrating the GIS, map, the GIS mapping from a third party database called NetDesigner to the uh, Esri database, which will be incorporated with the town GIS. So we will not be renewing our license at the end of this month. And we should have, um, hoping by the end of the year that we will have uh, all the data for the broadband updated in the Esri application, which will now be uh, commingled with all the DPW electric, um, you know, all the GIS data with, that the town has. Great. Uh, Okay. Um, as far as our work plan, which I sent out, um, these are the, the main uh, projects that we're working on that uh, we put in a priority list. Um, <clears throat> Calyx switches, uh, we had gone through the Calyx uh, switches. We're in the, um, we've just had Calyx visit us and there. Um, we feel that the network is fine the way it is on the Calyx side. Calyx are the, the, uh, is the networking uh, that is the broadband. So that's literally the equipment that the customers 
uh, connected to. The we had one switch that um, was a that we felt needed to be cloned so we could immediately um, we could cut any kind of outages um, down to a minimum, and that has been completed. So we now have um, the ability. If we lose one major switch, we will have it back up within 60 minutes. Uh, core routers uh, and maintenance, the um, bringing all the equipment under new maintenance agreements, making sure it's all um, firmware and everything's up to date, that uh, process is completed. Um, we have actually have sent the, um, uh, that purchase order was sent to me and I sent, sent it over to the vendor. So the network should be under, um, back under maintenance and um, that concern has will be has gone away. Um, the network uh, run test redundancy. We, um, we tested the uh, redundancy. It failed over uh, as it was designed and we are going to be testing redundancy on the network on a regular basis. We haven't decided exactly what that term will be. Probably be a quarterly um, uh, basis where we will, uh, once the new new network design is in place, we will be testing it on a regular basis for redundancy. And that should be no effect to, to, uh, of service to the uh, customers. Uh, the assessment uh, of the network, um, that's on number four, is complete. Again, we did meet with uh, Calix. We've done some cleaning up of just, just some data that you know was no longer uh, needed and we will continue to maintain and uh, the network of uh, assess the network on a regular basis as well. Um, we had new uh, appliances for DHCP service uh, servers. What we have decided and designed that we are going to co-locate the uh, new servers with uh, the equipment. And our goal here is right now is to try to separate the dependencies between the town network and the broadband network as much as we can. Um, as as the broadband network it expands, we get more and more customers. We're seeing the uh, importance of it. And so we're just gonna try to eliminate um, as much of the dependencies. So this is part of number six. This will do exactly that. It'll just start to separate um, as many dependencies as possible so that the network don't affect each other um, or have less chance of affecting each other if, uh, if there's issues on either side. Um, broadband. Again, just broadband town network dependencies, working with Jason, CIO, and in concert to uh, make sure everything is done properly and um, is creating positive, uh, um, a more resilient network. Um, we have set up uh, purely broadband uh, monitoring. We have, um, we have an approved, uh, just, just an application a couple thousand dollars. It's going to be strictly um, for the broadband network. And uh, right now the monitoring is done across the networks. It's not good or bad, but this way we know that uh, this will be focusing strictly on the devices that control the broadband network will give us um, uh, just a more understanding when we get alerts that we'll know from that application that is absolutely affecting the broadband or could be affecting the broadband uh, network opposed to us having to go and look at the alerts and do a little more, uh, take a little more time to decipher what the causes are. Um, the redesign of the core network is complete. We have come up with three designs. Those designs range anywhere from 75,000 to 120,000. And the difference in those numbers is uh, redundancy. Redundancy and money basically equal each other when it comes to technology. The more money you spend, the more redundancy you can build in. And the 120 mark, um, the high ladder uh, figure is, would create a complete redundant um, broadband network as probably as possible uh, with the conditions that the, um, the network's in today, meaning the location of the switches and um, all the other, uh, and all the, any of the resources supporting it. Um, and it would truly make the, the broadband network probably at 99.7% uptime. I think we could, if uh, we don't get this, uh, we could actually guarantee that, that kind of uh, uptime 
uh, within with the network. Um, and then, go ahead. Before you go on, I mean, this is a big price tag, right? So is this a discussion, and Dave, maybe you can answer, I'm not sure. So is there a budget consideration here that we need to discuss further around the funding for this, Dave? Is that help me yeah. understand? Uh, you know, the way the way I look at it is, you know, once we get those numbers all together, it's okay. going to be put in the 2022 budget or we're going to come to the board and talk about what the costs are and, and how we're going to fund it because it isn't planned in the 21. Budget. So we would have that discussion with you guys. Okay. All right. So a future meeting, but it sounds like you're still putting some of the details together. While you have a broad range, you need more details. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry, Greg. Keep going. No problem. And the, um, we have increased, um, uh, one of our vendors is uh, actually, it's taking place, I believe this weekend. Um, and we have a second vendor now that I have spoken to that is going to, uh, uh, we're gonna increase from 5G to 10G on uh, that circuit. So we'll have two 10G circuits uh, into the network. And that vendor is in doing the increase from 5G to 10G at uh, no cost. There will be an implementation uh, cost, but uh, as far as a monthly cost, there will be no increase to the uh, to the town. Great, great. Great. So Greg, can I ask just a question? Cause I lost track of this. I know that from the high school and from uh, the Concord public schools. So uh, obviously they have a big draw, but the high school isn't using town. Um, broadband is that correct so no, they are they are using it okay yeah. i thought there was something they were not using the high school that was um, yeah, they're, you know. they're using the fiber optic network they don't take broadband services from us okay that's what i thought okay but right. cms does right yeah yeah right. We, we have a school network that that it's all fiber it connects all the schools right okay all right just clarifying that okay thanks um so thank you, Greg. Appreciate the update. Um, and I take questions from the board. Alice, I know your hand's been raised for a while. So thank you. I had a couple of questions. Um, going back to the, the previous conversation in the document that you provided us. Um, I remember when Dave came to the board and told us that they were you were CMLP was going to hire outside consultants to assist with the backlog so that we could move forward and get those 400 completed or whatever the number is. Knowing now that the number is far less than the 400 at the time, are we still hiring outside consultants to do the work for us and um, doing the, I don't know, I think it was line installation. Yeah, and, uh, so, so Alice, that I will question, cost. yeah, that is, we are still getting, we're getting pricing, um, you know, 150 to 200 is still a lot. And to expedite that, um, to get those installs done, we would be looking for a third party vendor to do the fiber installation from the pole to the house. So Greg has been working on that. That I think is important because people will continue to, you know, request services. And if we can't get through that timely, we're just going to be delaying others from installation. So I think the priority for us is to get that backlog wiped out and then, you know, go forward with promotion and, and you know, getting new customers on board. So we are still doing that. Okay. So, you know, the second half of that question is, I think we talked at the last meeting about seeing a budget proposal for all of these nine priority items. And then we have a number of other items that were not quite the priority. It'd be great to see what we're looking at in the long-term budget scenario. And I, I know we have a budget meeting in December. We just talked a little bit about it, but if we're hiring um, consultants to assist in uh, install, installations, and we have these nine priority items, what are we looking at for a total budget commitment? And I'd hate to see us being short-sighted by not developing and building the most resilient system that we can because of a cost um, implication, if that's really what we're needed. Because we saw an outage of a week is pretty devastating to a lot of people in the town. So I don't yes. want to make sure we're making smart decisions. And if we could see the whole financial package, it helps us think about that. Yeah, and that's, that's the intention is to bring something to the board. You know, if the numbers so significant, you know, you guys say, yeah, go with option B, it makes the most sense for the next five to seven years, opposed to going with option C that is, you know, far too expensive. So that is our intent is to bring that stuff to you guys so that you guys have an understanding of 
what implications are going to be on the finances. Um, yeah. You know, so that's okay. coming for sure. Thank you. So, Dave, it's fair to say that these investments that are, were that many of the things Greg covered, they're within the purview of the current budget. So there's not a budget concern per se. Um, you've covered that for 2021. And we'll see more of it in 2022, right? I, I think in reality, you're going to see more of it in 2022, and it'll be built into the budget. Some of the stuff will happen in 21, and that's the stuff that um, I want to make sure you guys are aware of and, and, and that sort of thing. But, um, you know, what we do this year in the remainder of this year and what we do in the next year will be transparent and will be brought to you guys either way. And so, Dave, just to go back to Alice's point about using outside consultants, the estimate, and this is for Greg too, the estimate of 25 to 35 per month, assuming that that's in place now. So maybe that's 75 to 90 by end of November, right? And then so that the backlog real in real reality really won't be resolved until maybe April, May, June next year. Is that a fair guesstimate? Yeah, I think so. And and that's including the outside help. Right. Yeah, well, the only thing that I would say with the outside help is we haven't got pricing yet. You know, we've been reaching out. Um, so, you know, if we go on, on the history of what the pricing is, you know, we'd have a, a decent idea, but that could change. We don't know that yet. The 25 to 35 is current state, right? Yeah, currently it's 25 to 30 a month. Uh, yeah. You know, what we'd like to be doing with the, with the uh, third party vendor is to give them, you know, a cluster of uh, locations like head into this neighborhood and install, you know, fiber to 40 different homes. Then that's what they want, right? They want a, a bulk. And so they come in and they do that stuff. And then our team would then go in afterwards and do the install in the home and do the splicing. So it's taking out that that piece from the pole to the house, right? Um, and, and one of the vendors said they wouldn't come if they didn't have 30 or 40 to do at a whack because it didn't make sense to them. So, um, you know, Greg's done a good job getting a, a map together with clusters of where these customers that want services are so that, you know, when we're successful in getting a vendor and that is willing to do the work, we can say, Okay, here here's thirty places to go to, and they can report back to us when that stuff's done, and and then we can schedule our crews to go out and do the the detailed uh, in home work and splicing on the poles. Okay. And how many how many new requests are you getting each month? It really, I, I you know, we're I'd say, you know, sometimes we get one a day, sometimes we get three a day. Um, I would have to come back to you. I can I give you that in, in the next meeting, Brian, if we get an average. Well, if you're just averaging two a day, that's 60 a month. And uh, that's more than we can do. <laughs> right, right. Okay. okay, so let's make sure that we have a better update for next month on that. So what's coming in and what's going out and an expectation of um, sort of trying to project forward how we're gonna manage the backlog. I guess that's where all these questions are leading to, right? Um, uh, Gordon. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so I'm on the committee, uh, the, the, this you know study committee. Uh, I can't say exactly what the charge is. I've seen the warrant, but let's say that it's something along the lines of, hey, Concord wants uh, everybody to be able to have broadband if they want it. Okay, and that's approximately what the charge is. Um, these numbers to me at 30 a month says that it would take 10 years to uh, go from 1500 to 5,000, um, so whatever, you know, that's approximate. Um, uh, that, you know, is that, is, is that acceptable? 10 year or 9.7 year or whatever that is. Uh, another way to look at it would be if we focused on as a, as a performance metric, how quickly can we clear a backlog like that? They're kind of similar actually, because if we wanted to accelerate uh, and, and get to a, you know, higher, you know, move from 1500 to, 2,000 or 2,500 or 5,000 or whatever, um, you'd also need that capacity. But what I'm trying to say is, is that I'm interested in the idea of, of like focusing on the backlog as, as a key uh, measure of our success. 
Um, because, you know, if people are going to report satisfaction with broadband, that actually starts at the very first en encounter when they contact us and ask for it. And, you know, if they can't get it for six months, then that's going to push down the, the satisfaction numbers. Okay. All right. Thank you, Allison. Again, we're behind. So yeah. I'm just going to we keep going here. It's just a quick, a quick comment. Um, what I'm worrying about is similar, similar to uh, Gordon is that if we are bringing an outside consultant to get the fiber to the line and then we, we take over at that point and we don't have the capacity, we now have a bulk of the, of the backlog completed, but it still re relies on CMLP to take the fiber to the home and go in the home. Is there a reason that we're not using consultants to help us move the entire process along? Because it seems like we are still at CMLP causing the backlog. We are Yeah, creating so, so Alice, that's a really good point and a good question. Um, you know, we really feel that it's, it's important for our staff to, um, you know, do the, the install in the home because, you know, they're dealing with our customers and, um, you know, we found that um, contractors might be a little more aggressive in the home in terms of the way they install the stuff and, you know, the customer service piece there that just, we're going to end up going back and fixing it. That's been our, the history of it. So let our, you know, three or four uh, technicians that will handle the fiber in the home with care to the customer satisfaction. So that's been our experience. Um, and, you know, we, we, we think that's the right approach uh, at this point. We had we did talk about this exact thing though, um, mm -hmm. in terms of helping expedite, and um, I think the biggest thing that's going to help us expedite is getting fiber from the street to the house. Mm -hmm. okay. So maybe at a future meeting with Greg, where we can sort of try to uh, illustrate more carefully sort of how the project the backlog and how we're managing it. And I think you said it before we're going to leverage the consultant to help get that you know the the fiber in the street and then hear your staff um, do the home. So I, I think it's a good approach. And we also have open recs that we're still filling too. So I think bringing all that together to sort of help the board understand how we'll address the backlog would be helpful. Um, so, okay. So I'm actually just gonna stop here for a sec. We have two agenda items that remain. One is in regards to the advanced metering infrastructure, and I, I think we need to get to that agenda item. I'm going to acknowledge, though, that we also have a non-carbon emitting power supply um, discussion, and we're running out of time, so it's possible we might have to delay that discussion, Dave. So um, yeah. I don't know if that's critical or not. I'm just going to be up front and tell people that we may need to do that. So. I, I would prefer that we delay the second conversation about power supply and just get a real discussion about AMI without being uh, rushed. Okay. Dave, yeah. any concerns with that? Okay. No, we can do that. I, I just, you know, I'll just say this, if we're gonna defer the power supply uh, discussion, which is fine by me, I just wanna make sure the board's aware that um, we have a, another opportunity for another um, uh, renewable resource. And that was one of the discussions in there. We can talk about okay. it after, but, um, okay. I, you know, I don't want to move forward with something without the board knowing that it's there. So absolutely. So let's do our best to try to get through this discussion if we can, particularly if there's a new opportunity that you want some feedback from the board on. Um, let's do that. Uh, Gordon. We might want to meet more often. Agree. All right, that's a different consideration. Or if we need an ad hoc meeting, we can do that as well. So um, let's let's first follow up with the advanced meeting infrastructure. And Dave, if we need, we can um, would an alternate meeting schedule work like have an ad hoc meeting for that particular topic? Um, Maybe in two weeks. We we can if need be. I don't I prefer we need to meet twice a month. I think that's too much. It's a lot of prep time for staff. Um, and we don't have a lot of extra time, but, you know, if the board chose to meet multiple times a month, we adjust, but I think once a month is appropriate and then ad hoc as needed. So ad hoc is where it's going. Uh, let's, um, let's keep going. Let's see, uh, let's get to the advanced metering infrastructure. So, um, let's move forward with that discussion. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so I think, um, 
We're just going to give a, a brief project <clears throat> overview and then talk about the stakeholders um, meeting that's coming up. Laura, do you want to kind of kick it off here? Yeah, sure. Um, I'd like permission to share my screen again. You should be oh. able to. Okay. Uh, so, as re can you see this uh, yep. web page? Yep. Okay, so as uh, requested by the board, we did prepare um, a separate page on the CMLP website. It's on the main page under advanced metering system. And so far on here, what we've got is an overview of the project, some of the benefits that we're currently expecting from a new system. We've got the original RFP for the expert that we hired to help us with this project. Um, we've got a, uh, a project timeline. We've got the summary of our systems, applications, and the goals we want from a new system summary report is posted here. And then um, here is the information about the stakeholders meeting um, that is available. It's gonna be virtual. We had wanted it to be in person, but um, at this point, we're gonna to need to hold it virtually. So there's the, the login information from that. This is also where you're going to see the customer survey results posted. So this is on a, kind of a main page for the project. And as we get more uh, information and um, deliverables, we'll go ahead and post them to this place. So I wanted to show that to you. And then um, the other thing is we were talking about getting more communication out to customers about mm -hmm. the advanced metering project and just about advanced metering in general. Um, we have started putting out in our bill inserts um, there was one that went out in September that looks like this. And it basically just says, hey, do you know that we're currently planning to replace our electrical meters? And, you know, a bill insert can't contain a lot of beefy material. So it's kind of just a summary and then um, a URL to get to that web page we just looked at. And then also letting people know that we have the stakeholders meeting occurring on Wednesday, September 22nd from 7 to 8 p.m. Um, and letting them know that they can go to the town meeting calendar to get the, you know, the specific information on how to join the meeting. And what we were planning to do, um, Carol and I and Dave, was to use these bill inserts to perhaps sprinkle in one or two frequently asked question type style information about the advanced meters in the bill inserts. So that would be one way to reach out to customers. Um, the bill inserts are not only available in hard copy format for those who receive paper bills, but they're also available um, on, there's a section in uh, the customer service portion of the webpage called utility bill inserts. And you can click on that and get any present or past ones that you may have missed and folks who get their information electronically about our bills from our smart hub application um, can go and look at these bills electronically, these bill inserts uh, electronically here. So I just wanted to point out that new uh, web page. Uh, uh, Laura, sorry, yes. uh, just a detailed question. So if you have a, a digital bill, are you do you have a link in that bill to this uh, utility inserts page, or do they have to go seek it on their own? That's a good question. I believe you have to seek it on your own. What we have done is, um, in the past, explain to people through bill inserts and other ways on how to access these bill inserts, yeah, uh, the historical bill inserts. But I'll, I'll ask that question, Brian. I don't know if there's an automatic link in the electronic bill. Do we have any kind of email distribution list for those that are on electronic? Is we have some list? emails. I don't know if it's a core, you know, one to one correspondence with those who receive yeah. bills yeah. electronically. Um, but emails is certainly for those who, for whom we have addresses, certainly a, a communications method that we will will we will use. Yep. Um, so uh, that's the web page <clears throat> on the stakeholder meeting. Um, I believe that uh, I did pass to you, Wendy, I don't know if you distributed it, a draft agenda for that meeting. Yep, the board has it, yep. Okay, and um, 
will probably follow at this point. We're not, we're not anticipating changes, so we'll be following that agenda. Barbara Leary, who is our communication specialist from the consultant from Lemmerhart Consulting. Um, and one of the reasons we chose this firm is because they are very strong on customer outreach. Uh, Barbara Leary is their specialist, and she will be the moderator for that stakeholder uh, meeting. Um, We also at the meeting will have um, a benefits fact sheet, uh, frequently asked questions, which we are developing right now and is quite lengthy, um, and a technology systems graphic. Uh, I don't have those in final format yet. They're still under development, but those are all planned to be distributed at that stakeholder meeting. So I believe I've answered most of the questions except of course Gordon's because he's got his hand raised right now and I don't know what his question is. <laughs> All right. Is this All a right, good moment Gordon. to talk about the stakeholder meeting? Sure. Yeah. Okay, sure. Uh, I have a, a, a one major concern that I have is, is that uh, there's um, a number of people, probably a few of them are actually participating in this meeting that um, are deeply committed to an anti smart meter anti RF radiation stance. Um, and they will be at that meeting, uh, bringing their views. Um, and I don't have an objection to that. You know, personally, I can't tell them that they're wrong. I, you know, science can't really prove a negative. Uh, so I guess what I'm wondering, what I'm concerned about is, is that if they're the only voice in a in a, in a, basically you think of it as, as a scientific discussion, um, then they will by default win, win the game. If there's nobody prepared to defend what we're doing on a scientific basis. Um, and then just, that's the general question I'd offer specific that I would ask that the stakeholder meeting be limited to town residents um, it's sort of like a town meeting. When you go up and you take the microphone, you say your name and your address. And the reason why I propose that is, is that uh, I don't want, again, uh, you know, a, a huge crowd of people from out of town. Maybe they have credentials, maybe they don't, but they're not really representing uh, the views of, of the people uh, here in the town. So th those are my two, uh, two, two thoughts about it. It's all in the meeting management process, right? So I think it's going to be helpful to have a consultant. Um, but Laura, I'm sure that we're sort of, we can plan for this and manage that accordingly. Right? You know, we can plan to a certain extent. And I, I want to just point out that, Gordon, this is a very, um, you know, open-ended and transparent meeting that we intend to have. We probably will spend a little bit of time going over the customer survey yep. results so that people in the room are aware not just of the voices of the folks in the room, but you know, of a thousand residents that answered this survey, you know, here are the major concerns and, and interested topics that they brought up. Um, and so uh, the other thing I wanna mention is that, you know, our consultant specifically was charged with looking at non um, EMF based solutions. And so there will be a discussion of fiber to the home and power line carrier you know, and, and any other options that are currently out there for a system and talking about the pros and cons. So, you know, hopefully it's not going to be a, a situation where we've got, you know, one view, just two, two options and people facing off, you know, against each other. It's intended Good. to get feedback, but we will have to limit probably, we don't, if we're only going to have an hour and I know it's going to go over, um, we probably will have to limit, you know, people's feedback to, I don't know how many minutes, but just a specific time frame. Thank you. Yeah. And can I, I just can I just um, make a point that uh, just it sounds like you, I'm, I'm sure you will, but you need to have somebody maybe address the science up front um, um, to to anticipate these sorts of issues. I mean, Gordon makes a very good point. I mean, I hope that there's somebody there who will talk about the uncertainties and about the viability and the reasons for. Um, going the direction we're going based on science are you going to be able to do that no. we will be able to point to um and we intend to point to information that's available from different um 
organizations, reputable organizations, you know, government-based and other um, that share some of the statistics about the variables that many people are concerned about. I do want to be careful not to make this a meeting that's all about are you, you know, for or against this, because I don't think we're going to convince any minds during that meeting. And so it really, I, I like Gordon, I don't want to, if people have a certain viewpoint, I don't want to spend time battling and telling them their viewpoint's wrong. That's absolutely right. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Uh, thank you. All right. So, so that that's my point exactly. What the customer survey shows is that a lot of people are interested in advanced metering systems, but don't fully understand what it is. Let's make sure this meeting is focused on educating people on, you know, advanced metering uh, systems, and not about you know a vote of confidence in something that people don't understand. Uh, so I, I really hope that this meeting focuses on here's what we're actually talking about rather than tell us what you think. Right. So, but I think you've all seen the agenda and I'm hopeful that the introduction was going to do just that. There's a welcome by Dave and then um, Laura will speak to get into the new meter technology. So I, I think it's a well-structured agenda and um, you know we'll be prepared in a bit. So I agree. So. Um, I do not see hands raised from any of the attendees who are from the board. So I'd like to keep moving on the agenda, if that makes sense. Okay. So we will try to get to this non-carbon emitting power supply topic. So Dave, I'm going to hand it over to you or Laura to introduce this topic. Yeah, well, I'll let Laura kind of go through and she's, she's in the details of this. So okay. we'll see if we can expedite it. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Um, I think once again, I am going to uh, share my screen. Kind of like this feature. Okay. Um, let's see. I want to be, where do I want to be? I want to go to, uh, I'm on our webpage and I'm going to take you to the power supply portfolio section of the web page. Um, and I want you to, I want to focus your attention down here on this chart. Can everybody see that or should I make that a little bigger? You can make it bigger, it'd be great. No, not smaller. Yes. There. Okay, is that a bit, a bit better? Yep. I'm sorry it's so messy, but it does contain a lot of information. Basically yep. what this is showing us is that in 2020, Okay, we bought 10% uh, of our power supply came from um, Massachusetts. It came from generating resources that had bundled Massachusetts class one recs associated with those power purchases. And so when we bought the power from a Massachusetts class one qualifying facility, we used the power and we retired the recs, okay? In that same year, 6% of the power supply came from bundled main class two facilities, 3% from nuclear, 5% from NIPA, which is the New York uh, Power Authority hydro generation. 7% um, came from so the in-town solar, which we don't have RECs for, okay? But I, I list that separately because it's been requested in the past. But I'm not including it because uh, when I come up with our total percentage of non-carbon emitting, because what, uh, what happened is we bought 10 plus 6 plus 3 plus 5, and we bought 25% non-associated or unbundled Massachusetts class 1 recs on top of all this other stuff we bought bundled. So that if you get up to here, we're just under 50%, I think it was 49% of our power supply in 2020 came from non-carbon emitting sources. So does that make sense? You, you go up this chart here and then you swing over to the right, you add the unbundled RECs and here's your total. So it was smaller than in 2018. It was, and I think the exact numbers are up here. Yeah. Uh, so in, 
2018, 57% was non-carbon emitting, then it went down to 53, then it went down to 49. Okay, so those are the exact numbers that go with this, with these totals. You can see it going down. And we know the reason for that is that even though we were collecting more over this time period in rates uh, for renewable energy, the price of renewable energy credits was soaring. It went from like $7.50 a megawatt hour in 2018 to $45 a megawatt hour in 2020. So we struggled to have enough money to pay for RECs. And when we originally designed the renewable energy strategy, we said, we're gonna keep rates stable and we're gonna allow the amount of renewable energy that we purchase every year to fluctuate, okay? Because the market price of those credits changes. So rather than setting a fixed amount, we wanna be 60%, then 70, then 80, we said that could really impact rates as the price of non-carbon emitting energy fluctuates. So we this happened on purpose. The good news is we're collecting even more now. There was another half cent added to the 2021 rates for renewable energy. And the price has come down a little bit and we're now purchasing more bundled energy that comes with emissions uh, certificates. It'll be still 10% from class one. Um, now we've got 8% from main class two. We added some hydro resources. We significantly bumped up the nuclear to 10%. Uh, we still have the on-system solar, but we're anticipating with the new revenues and the lower price being able to purchase 44%, somewhat similar to what we did in 2018, of non-associated class one racks. So that's going to put us up at, you know, this is 76% of purchases. So we think we're going to go from 49% in 2020 to 70, what did I say, 76% in 2021 and then getting up to 90% in 2022. Um, so, and if we kept rates the same and costs of RECs stayed the same, we'd actually go over 100% in 2023. Because if you took this 44% and you added it to the already 55%, you're basically at 100% by 2023. Now things can change, okay? This is a forecast. Um, given current market prices. So this could change, but this is what our best estimate is of how we will progress over the next several years from our current roughly 50% non-carbon emitting to a much higher percentage. Yep. Great. Does that make sense? It does, and Laura, I love the fact that you put it on the website, it's great. Okay, that was another request from the board. Yep, thank uh, you. So you still anticipate a half cent increase at the end of this year to keep us on this trend? No. So this 44% assumes that we will that that we are collecting the additional half cent that was put into rates with rates effective January 1st, 2021. I have not put in an additional half cent, Brian, which was the final component of the plan to get to here. Right. So, so the original strategy was as, as long as we're below uh, the 100% target that we'd add half a penny each year um, and then allow it to fluctuate. And then we had um, talked about what to do with uh, reserves uh, should we get to 100%. So um, this is great, um, but low rec prices are not going to stay. They're, they're going to be in demand again. So well, this is assuming about a $39 price for Rex, these, these okay. percentages. And that also doesn't mean that we can't revisit further funding of Rex, but that's a topic for a different day, I think. Yeah, sure. yep. the board can absolutely yeah. decide to put in that additional half cent, Brian. I did on this one because I just wanted you to see what it looked like. Um, and you do need to consider that we are very close to the top now, yep. you know, mm -hmm. highest price municipal in Massachusetts. So that's something else to consider. That's great. And then Laura, you want to just briefly go over the opportunity that's um, we're looking at? Um, yes. Let's see how brief it is going to be. Um, I'm sorry, bear with me a second. I.
Okay, so we have an opportunity to um, potentially participate in a project to be built by a company we've done business with before, D.E. Shaw Renewable Investments, also known as DESRI. Um, the project's located in Granby and East Granby in the Connecticut River Valley. Um, it's called the Broadleaf Project. It's anticipated to be 100 megawatts. Um, it would be one of the largest solar projects in New England. And um, they're proposing a 25 year term with a very competitive uh, starting price and a 2% escalation with a cap. Um, it comes bundled with renewable energy certificates. So that would be, they would likely be, and I believe they will be Massachusetts class one. Um, I think it's going to be a way for us to uh, add additional bundled energy and Massachusetts class one recs um, at a price that's not going to um, significantly impact rates. And in fact, I don't think it'll impact rates much at all. It's that competitive. Um, they're estimating that off takers, depending on the ultimate group of participating municipals would be able to off take, I think the number was 4% of our um, needs through this project. Uh, and they wanted to get an indication of interest, a non-binding indication of interest. And so Dave and I wrote back and said, oh yeah, we're definitely interested. It was non-binding. So we didn't feel that we had to wait to get board approval for that. It's not agreeing to the project. It's just saying, give us more information to keep us included. So I think we, we definitely would be interested at the 4%. I would even say that if we could get more, we might want to want to look at that. And, and to add to that, um, any that scenario, so if someone, one of their customers doesn't want to buy in, uh, they would come to us just if we wanted more and we would take what we could get. What is the timeline for the project? Uh, is it just under construction now? Not uh, yet under construction? Let's see, it was, um, I'm sorry, I should have this off the top of my head. I think it was the end of 2024, but let me just look at this. Well, that yeah, works fourth, well with our timing as we have other contracts come. Yeah. Fourth quarter, fourth quarter of 2024, Alice. Perfect. Fourth. I mean, that we have a number of contracts that go through 2022, 24, and 25, I think. So that sounds great. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a great opportunity. And yeah. the more we can get, the better, sounds to me. <laughs> as long as the price is reasonable, and it sounds like it is. Yeah. Or, and, sorry, Dave. Go ahead, Dave. No, I was just going to say, you know, obviously it's early in the, in the process, here, but as more information comes, we will obviously bring it to the board and keep you yep. guys updated. Gordon? Uh, just a couple of points and really in a way you guys, uh, David and, and Laura have both educated me about how to think about a, a, a power portfolio um, and some of the risks. There's never anything that's risk-free. There's not never anything that's perfect, but some of the things that I've heard you guys talk about in the past have been that our portfolio is becoming long. This is another 25 year. Um, and maybe I don't really have a problem with that because we're locking in something good. Uh, but, you know, just, uh, and we maybe don't even have to discuss it here, uh, but that was one thought I had. The other thought I had was, is that, and I think this came up in the context of nuclear, that sometimes there's a risk that if we sign one of these contracts that we have to take the power at the time that it's generated, regardless of whether or not we actually need it at that instant, and then we end up having to resell it back out at a time where the price may not be advantageous. So um, I guess, uh, uh, from those, and there may be other risks that I'm not even thinking of. Um, I'd also say, hey guys, I really trust your judgment. Um, so, yeah, uh, so portfolio management is something that Laura and I work closely with E and E on, so that we don't go mm -hmm. long if we do. It's only for a short period, so it's something that's factored into the equation for sure on any contract that we do. Um, that's renewable specifically because they generally generate at a certain period of time. So. It is taken into consideration on this one for sure. Okay. 
And I think last month's conversation with Annie &E, um, was a, we talked a lot about risk and risk management in the portfolio design. And I think this is I'm, Gordon's point is well taken, but understood. And the cap of two percent that's annual two percent increase is that what that is? So the escalator would be um, a fixed 2% to the price annually, but then once after a certain number of years, the cap would kick in. And even if 2% meant more than the cap, you just get capped at the cap. Say that again, take pay that. Yep. So um, it's a 2% escalator in the price, but after a certain number of years, if the 2% escalator results in a price that is over the cap price, then you don't continue to pay the 2% escalator, you just pay the cap. I guess I feel like I need a graphic on that, but we can get to that when we get more detail. <laughs> yeah, it works, it works out to be that the cap kicks in at about year 20. So oh, once you've been escalating okay. it 2% per yeah. year. Okay. Yeah, you, okay. All right. Okay. Uh, Brian, you had a question. Yep. Sorry. So, all right. So this is a quite a large facility um, and it's also solar, which is, is um, you know, operates in the day. Is there storage with this project? Is it dispatchable or is it just when produced? As far as I'm aware, there is no storage component that is being offered in any case to the off takers. I don't think there's storage with it anyway, but if it, if, even if there is, it's not being offered to us. So it's going to be, we need to integrate it and take it when it comes. But as David said, that hourly dispatch forecast will be conducted for us to see how that impacts the portfolio on an hourly basis, not right. just a monthly basis. So, so that will help in our um, providing us more power when our, our, when our demand goes up during the days. Um, but it also will provide more power during our spring and fall solar saturation Sundays. Um, so you're going to take all those kind of considerations of you're going to need to arbitrage on those Sundays into account when you look at this. Dave's no. saying no, you're saying yes. No, I mean, when you talk about solar saturation, this is on the other side of the transformer. So it's, it, it doesn't add to the solar saturation issue internally. Right, but it does provide power when we're in town producing our needs. Yeah. Well, you said it correctly, Brian, we'll have to arbitrage it. It's gonna be coming in as a, an import from, from Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So it won't be saturated on the CMLP system because if we Correct. can't use it, we'll get rid of it before it gets here. Yes. So, so we're, this, we're talking about two sort of different things. Yeah, yeah. so if, if, if we're paying um, you know, a price per kilowatt that is our, let's say our energy average, and then on those Sundays, we're gonna be selling that when most New England has um, a lot of generation and low, com, low demand, I would assume there's a loss in the arbitrage there. It's unknowable at this point, but that of course a loss is a potential problem. Yeah. Um, the other thing that, would help is you know maybe by Q4 2024 we'll actually have a battery. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Right. Awesome. Okay. Great. Right. I, I would hope that's the case. Yeah, and 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 I just want to appreciate um, the finding of this project and putting out the the proactive stance that both Dave and Laura have had on on going after these initiatives. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, I'm amazed that it's actually a decent rate, which is great. Because I'm expecting the prices to start increasing pretty soon with all the demand. So, okay, I'm just going to come in. It's 9:34. We're after over. But uh, Gordon, go ahead. Uh, Laura, what do you think the chances are that the price of uh, power could actually collapse? Because there's a risk when we go long. There's a risk on on that side. To me, so, that doesn't seem that likely. But the marginal cost of some of these renewables are very low. So, maybe. So I'm know. actually a person. Gordon, that thinks that a future where variable energy prices are zero or negative is actually quite possible. Hmm. But, okay, so that is one risk, one future possibility. There are, it's like a Monte Carlo simulation of how the futures could play out, right? Many different possibilities. And that's one of them, um, in which case we'll be paying a fixed rate when we could be buying energy free from the grid. And let's say one of those futures, we have a huge build out in New England of renewables. So not only is there excess power on an hourly basis, 
but it's all non-carbon emitting. So that if we had just held our guns and built, you know, invested in nothing in 2021, we could be enjoying a future where we're buying all non-carbon emitting energy for free. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, that's possible. But let's think about that. You know, we're also causing our own future to happen. If we don't invest today and other people don't invest today, that future never happens. Yeah. Right. So it's almost a catch 22 and exactly how it's going to play out. Certainly 20 years into the future, nobody knows. And the whole structure of the market may change this idea of paying for capacity separately from energy. You know, the ISO may end up reorganizing and restructuring markets. So it's almost impossible to tell, right, how it's going to work. But is what you're talking about possible? Absolutely. And, uh, and just for a second, I want to make my sustainability comment here. You know, uh, 40 years ago, uh, Exxon scientists predicted a 1% uh, increase in global temperatures. It was a 40 year forecast. Um, we, as a society ignored that and now have experienced it. Um, so I, I, I like your point, Laura, about the fact that if, if we don't take the lead, then this may not happen. And, and, and Concord is a leader in this area. And, and I, I think that we would uh, value that, uh, exp you know, that, that uh, future. Great. Thank you. All great discussion. It sounds like a great opportunity. Um, Dave, you certainly have the support of the board at this point. Um, and I assume we'll get more updates in our next meeting, potentially. Yeah, you, you know, as it, more information comes available, we will yep. definitely keep this on the uh, agenda. Uh, yep. It may not be next meeting, it may be, who knows. But uh, yep. it's it's, okay. it's a good, good opportunity for us. Okay, all right. So uh, recognizing that it's 9.37, um, I don't have any liaison updates. I don't, I don't know if, I don't see any hands raised by the public um, at this time. Of course there was one. So Carlin, of course, now they're all coming up. Okay, so um, just a, a take for the board. Can people stay 10 more minutes? I have a hard stop. So I'll have to leave okay. in just a couple of minutes. Okay, thank you. But I, I can listen to the video and for public comment. Okay, appreciate it. Okay, so um, Carlin, read. Right. Hi, Carlin Reed, 83 Whitsand. Thank you very much for today's discussion. I will be very interested to see those slides from the survey. Uh, the most interesting slide to me was the demographics sur uh, slide. I wish that had been up a little bit longer. That's the foundation for all of your results. And so I'm looking forward to having that posted. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Carlin. Uh, Pamela Dritt. Thank you, Pamela Dritt, 13 Concord Green. Um, can Concord create municipal storage so that we can do uh, time of use uh, rate storage essentially on a, on a town wide ride basis? So that if even if we do have to take the, the expensive um, solar project energy in during those hot days, we can just store it. Um, for example, what about a sand pit storage battery in the StarMet Superfund site? Uh, that would be something that we could probably do that would really help. And, and thank you, Dave, and, and Laura particularly. I'm so appreciative. You make complex ideas clear. Thank you for looking at the big picture and making it understandable for us. You, you explain the trade-offs in a way that is, is truly helping us create the future like you just did. I, I was just so moved and appreciative. And I think that our ultimate goal is to make uh, uh, green energy our future. I think that CMLP should indeed get the credit for local solar generation, even though they don't buy the RECs, because the purpose of RECs is to encourage green energy production and to, to, to buy outside RECs to make up for the RECs that we generated locally on solar rooftops is absurd, it seems to me. That's a disincentive to, 
to the payout of solar. Um, and I had other comments, but I will shut up. <laughs> Pamela, thank you. I appreciate your comments. And we will be talking about battery storage in a future meeting, so uh, more to follow. Uh, and then David Allen. Let me add my voice to the appreciation, particularly Laura, for your edification of us. Thank you so much. A couple of pieces. Uh, the first about the AMI public meeting later down in the month. Um, if we look back to the prior public meeting where uh, some of this was a hot topic, uh, two people came to the mic each about a half dozen times. One of those people was from out of town, uh, an agitator in several words. Uh, that's simply not appropriate. And I do trust that steps will be taken so that we only hear from folks in town. Uh, beyond that, as uh, the board knows so well, I have prepared information from that meeting going forward. First of all, uh, public information from the National Cancer Institute on this subject. There is a science. There is no reason why uh, it shouldn't be the most prominent item. Uh, and most importantly, uh, the point of this is not to struggle over this point, but to uh, get on with folks understanding AMI. Uh, beyond the National Cancer Institute, I've also prepared for the board, as each of you should be aware, a uh, summary of a uh, meeting held by these folks. Now, on the second topic, um, Conquer Broadband. Um, as we're all aware, after the outage, really the core question was, uh, does this impact our prospects going forward? Let me uh, suggest and request that going forward on a monthly basis, we have actually exact numbers about uh, the number of uh, requests that are being made from uh, prospective conquered customers. Uh, not all of them will turn into uh, actual customers, nonetheless, let's actually take the precise temperature about what's going on there. We, uh, all of us, you certainly as the board need to have uh, uh, a very clear eyed view about whether or not there's been an impact. That'll be hard to get, but at least you can get numbers and I trust you'll take it forward from that. Beyond that, on this question of a backlog, uh, just a taste of perspective, going back to the very beginning of this, uh, when Mark Howell made his choices about the size and the whole board really, uh, the size of the bond to request of the town meeting, uh, choice was made to lowball it big time. To start a telecom company with 4 million bucks? Are you kidding me? That's a joke. Mark pulled it off. It's really extraordinary that he did it. The time has come now when we're going to be faced with a question, okay, do we change that point of view? Uh, the prospect that we would wait 10 years to get rid of a backlog was raised here. Can't be serious. Um, what is more, this uh, new task force uh, will be looking at the prospect of spending at least 10 million bucks. Uh, so we see two and a half times that original bond issue. Uh, this ramifies into the organization. Instead of a few folks doing installs, it means prospectively lots of folks. Uh, I invite a perspective here that uh, looks to a sea change in thinking. Uh, while it worked, Mark was able to get things going with a huge backlog that took months and months to resolve. An operating business doesn't go forward that way, and that's going to call for a sea change in thinking about strategy here. Enough on that. Uh, and as always, I appreciation for all that you do. Thank you. All right. Thank you, David. Um, 
did you have another comment or you just you're, didn't put your hand down? Uh, yes, please. I'm sorry. Okay, um, so I'll just ask you to be brief because we need to yes. wrap up. Um, will our new smart meters be wireable to the fiber optic systems or period, wireable period, so that customers with RF radiation health concerns can still participate? I don't think the idea of trying to counter uh, the science with, well, we have no proof that these concerns are real. So therefore we're going to dismiss them is going to be helpful. And, and, and whether the, the information comes from outside the town or inside the town, the information is there and it's the information itself, not its, not its source that matters. We're all citizens of the US and the world, not just conquered. I don't think the idea of limiting our deliberations to local residents is uh, useful, but, but because won't help keep that information out. Um, and also, if you make the cost of opting out from the non-smart, from the smart meters too low, you'll have far fewer uptakes and among the, the non-involved people, high information people. I think you have to really make the opt-outers pay all of the increased costs, including the externalized ones of not having enough people to make the smart metering time of use rates work. So please, when you do the, 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 the pricing, consider that. All right. Also, um, broad, broadband is a public good, I think, like electricity and water and sewer. Um, the bipartisan infrastructure le legislation has support for broadband expansion. So are we prepared to take, treat that as another, ele another utility on the same level almost as electricity? Okay. Going forward, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. I appreciate it. And um, I, I, don't, I believe that we are looking at all technology solutions as part of our evaluation. So uh, more to follow. And um, if you attend the stakeholders meeting, you'll hear about that. Um, so finally, not seeing any more hands, I think I would entertain a motion to um, close the meeting at 948. Can I uh, I move that we adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Gordon, is that a second? Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> Quick roll call. Uh, Gordon? Yes. Yeah. Brian? Yes. Ann? Yes. I think that's a yes. It looks like she has a question, Brian. but she can't unmute. Yeah. Can you uh, unmute? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yes. Uh, Wendy's a yes, so I officially call the meeting to close. So thank you all. Good discussion. And thanks again, Dave and uh, Laura. Great, great content. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank, right. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.